Welcome to video 36 in Catholic Distance University's course, Theology 552, Introduction to Liturgy and Sacraments. And we're on the Eucharist still, and we're in the middle of a march through time to look at the evolution and the growth of the Roman liturgy as we know it today. How did it get to where it is? We got to look at the, where it came from. And of course, the Roman liturgy comes from Rome, but in the eighth century, something um, magnificent begins to happen. And it's, the Roman liturgy is, you know, just keep in mind, there's no central authority when it comes to liturgy. Uh, there are different liturgical centers that have influence, yes, but uh, liturgy varies from place to place. Each bishop has his own book. There's no printing press. There's no standardization. Um, and outlying parishes use collections of various kinds. And one of those collections uh, of, of parish priests' prayers that evidently came from Rome. Someone collected them, and some people, probably maybe pilgrims to Rome, transported them back to Gaul. So that had been circulating around, and that had been merging with local Gallican traditions uh, as far as the liturgy goes. But in around the year 750, a new king came to the throne in France, what's now France. It was still called Gaul then. And um, the, it was the Franks. The Franks had been around for 200 years, but quite frankly, <laughs> not to be too punish here, the, the Franks, the first dynasty of 200 years worth of Franks was not very good. Uh, morally not very good. They became Catholics in, in name only, at least uh, the leaders. They were illiterate. They were kind of barbaric, really. And um, Pepin the Short comes to the throne and begins a new dynasty, which is called the Carolingian dynasty. And he is a man who is serious about unifying his empire. He's serious about his people being uh, serious about Christ and the Catholic Church and the tradition that goes back to the apostles. And uh, so there was a special bond that developed between him and the Pope. Um, of course, the, so many Franks went on Rome to pilgrimage, and that's great. But uh, the Pope actually went on pilgrimage in a certain way, crossed the Alps to consecrate Pepin king. And he did that in, um, up in uh, Paris, which is kind of extraordinary. So Pepin is crowned by the king, uh, by the Pope in Paris. And Pepin, in gratitude, comes down and clears out a barbarian tr group of tribes, the Lombards, from central Italy. And he donates all of central Italy that he conquered from the Lombards, he donates that to the Pope. So uh, that donation of Pepin makes the Pope a temporal lord. Uh, he had already been a magistrate in the Roman Empire, had great honor, but now he's really the king of central Italy. And uh, that's th that development uh, has its... Uh, uh, as obviously has problems associated with it. But what I want to focus on here for the liturgy's sake is something beautiful that happens in that Pepin wants to really unify his people and he wants to unify it liturgically in the way they pray. So he asks the Pope, he wants to do it right and he wants things to be standardized. So he asks the Pope for a book, a book that he can have duplicated, that can serve as the sacramentary for the empire. And in the Roman Rite can be established as part of the, the empire's culture. So the Pope sends what we know now as the Gregorian sacramentary. And there's a problem uh, in that the Gregorian sacramentary is for bishops only. Well, what about priests? And it has a lot of Roman feasts in it and things like that, but how about local heroes, local uh, martyrs and bishops and saints. So anyway, what happens really is kind of a hybridization that goes on. The Roman liturgy is enriched with uh, Gallican prayers and Gallican traditions. And there's a man who, Charlemagne is the, the next king, he's crowned he, emperor in Rome itself on Christmas Day, the year 800 AD. And Charlemagne what really wants to accelerate and extend this renaissance of Catholic culture in his empire. What's fascinating is that Charlemagne himself, who wants to promote a renaissance, is illiterate. And uh, he learns, he really works hard to learn to read, and he can barely do that. And he, he, he never learns to write. And this kind of just shows the depth of illiteracy. If, if the emperor can't read and write, what about 
the common people or other nobles. So literacy has gone into eclipse and it's the monks who keep it alive. So he has a monk, Alcuin, who's, who's one of his advisors and Alcuin helps to enrich the sacramentary with uh, an appendix. And that appendix that he wants to be distinct out of respect for the sacramentary gets blended in. And so what really we have emerge a marriage or hybrid, a grafting in of Gallican stock into the Roman trunk and it's kind of beautiful uh, because some of the things that we most treasure, I think, as Catholic Christians of the, of the Roman Rite, actually come from this Gallican ingrafting. The Roman Rite is rather austere, and the, the, the Gauls love to celebrate. They love feasts. And so they enrich the Holy Week rites tremendously. They've picked up some things from the East that never got uh, really directly transported into Rome. They picked up a much more elaborate veneration of the cross on Good Friday. Um, and they also added things. They, they, they came up with poetic hymns. Remember, Rome is kind of reticent about hymns or a little reserved about it. Well, the Gallicans loved hymns. So the Easter sequence, the Exultet, was written by a, 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 Gallic, a Gaulish priest. And, and that becomes part of this hybridized rite, as well as so many other things. Behold the wood of the cross on Good Friday, uh, on, on which hung the Savior of the world. Come, let us worship. You know, Christ our light, carrying in the Easter candle with the Christ our light, thanks be to God. That's from Gallican contribution to the liturgy. So we have these beautiful rites and celebrations that come in from Gaul. But we also have a big change that comes in when it comes to communion bread. Up till now, the West has used ordinary bread, leavened bread, and the East generally also uh, has used this, except for uh, a couple of traditions in the East, which are Maronite and Armenian. But everybody else used leavened bread. And uh, all of a sudden, the, some of the monks most probably because of Old Testament influence and then looking at the, 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 the synoptic gospel accounts where it, it, it appears very much like it's a Passover meal. They said, well, Christ must have used unleavened bread at the Last Supper, so we should start using unleavened bread. So this starts in about the 8th century. And again, it, this is happening in Gaul. It's not happening in Rome. It's happening up in Gaul with the Roman liturgy being mixed with these Gallican innovations. Um, and what happens is the next century, you know, Charlemagne comes to the throne and there's some great things happening in the Carolingian Empire. But meanwhile, in Rome, the, 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 the ninth century is a terrible time. Um, it's a terrible time of moral decay. It's, it's a time of disillusion in the papacy and shoddy liturgy. Um, just a couple of things that happen. The Saracens come in and sack Rome. Um, they steal lots of relics. There's a scramble to try to protect relics and protect sacred things. That's like 845, 846 AD. And then a little bit later, you have depravity in the Sea of Rome, sadly. You know, we had terrible, most of us know that there were some terrible Renaissance popes. Well, there's some terrible medieval popes as well. One of them, Stephen VI, hated his predecessor so much, Formosus, that he had him exhumed and tried his corpse, dressed in papal regalia, um, excommunicated him, uh, ripped off, uh, de degraded him uh, of his orders, dressed him in lay clothes, buried him, and ultimately uh, the corpse was thrown in the Tiber. Horrible stuff. And I'm just telling you this so you just kind of know the action was in Gaul where there's some beautiful things happening there in the liturgy and in spiritual life, and Rome is really going through a terrible time. In Gaul, at the beginning of the next century, 10th century, there is a reform movement of the monastic life, and it centers in a place called Cluny, there's a monastery founded there, and a lot of times at this point, monasteries are controlled by noble families. Noble families give land to monasteries, but then they want to control it, and it's actually in the stipulations. We'll give you the land, but we want uh, you know, uh, to approve who the next abbot's going to be, and uh, oftentimes it was someone in their family. So anyway, um, often the, the nobles who became abbots also didn't want to keep a strict Benedictine rule, so they mitigated fast laws and they weren't living a, the, the tough Benedictine life. So Cluny, the nobleman who donated land, was a holy man who said, 
we want you to have complete freedom. You have complete freedom from our family. Uh, we'd love you to pray for us, but you have no other obligation than that to our family for this gift. So Cluny became an independent monastery, not under the control of local lords, actually with a very special loyalty to the See of Peter. And in fact, it, it spawned monasteries in the next several hundred, maybe 100 years, 150 years. There were a thousand daughter monasteries from Cluny, many of which were in Rome. And guess what those monks who were the reform movement inside of Rome and the spiritual vitality in the city of Rome, what liturgy did they celebrate? They celebrated the Gallican enriched liturgy of their homeland, of Roman liturgy that had been transplanted to Gaul, been enriched there with things grafted in, and they brought it back to Rome. And one of their number became the Pope, Pope Gregory VII. Uh, the end of, of, the, of the 11th century, this very strong man came to the papal throne. And of course, that impacted the liturgy. And Pope Gregory VII was the first one, first pope, who himself took the reign and took the lead in trying to, to make the Roman rite standard. But the Roman rite that he wanted to make standard was the one he knew, which was enriched by all these Gallican uh, additions. So this is the first time a pope in the 11th century tries to you know, um, promote the Roman liturgy throughout the Western Latin speaking world. Uh, prior to that, it was the emperors who tried to promote the Roman rite. Um, and generally speaking, it's always the diocesan bishop who rules when it comes to liturgical matters. And here there's directives from Rome that diocesan bishops ought to be using, uh, making use of, of the, the Roman Missal or the Roman sacramentary. Actually, that's part of the story of this period in time. There wasn't a Missal until about now because the Mass was celebrated, the, the model for Mass was the Bishop's Mass. And, and the Bishop's Mass had subdeacons and it had deacons and it had acolytes and had the lay people playing a role and it had singers. So you had different books for the different people that were performing the different roles in the liturgy. You know, books were big, they were expensive. There's no sense in having a book that has stuff that's not pertinent to you if you're the choir director, or if you're the bishop, you're not leading the chants. So anyway, there wasn't one person doing the whole thing, so there's no need for one book. But you have monks who are priests, and you know, early on, monks were generally speaking lay people. And there was only enough monks ordained to serve the monastic needs in terms of the sacraments. But when monks start becoming uh, missionaries, then there, and that happened kind of early. When monks are missionaries, you need a lot more monks to be ordained priests. And they're on the move. And they can't really do a pontifical liturgy. They're a priest only, not a bishop. And they, they don't have the luxury of a choir and subdeacons and deacons. So they need a portable book. And so the first missal that has everything together uh, in a portable way for uh, a non-pontifical mass is what's called the Babio Missal. Irish monks who, who landed in northern Italy, of all places, um, in Babio, northern Italy, that, that is the earliest missal we have, and it dates from about, the, about 700 or so. Uh, but, you know, at this point in time, presbyteral masses are becoming more standard. Um, and this is kind of, in some ways, a sad thing. Uh, the, the bishop still had the custom of stational masses. You know, just like today, we have the custom that, that the bishop is the one who does confirmation. But there's just too much for him to do. So a lot of times he has an auxiliary bishop who does a lot of confirmations, right? Um, so it, it, what, what the, the bishops did, the stational mass was an institution, you know? The bishop's mass is going to happen in various parishes. Well, the bishop deputized another priest to do it a lot of times because he was busy at court, you know, uh, do, at, at Aachen where, where Charlemagne was or something. So anyway, the bishop now becomes less of the father of the family. Yes, there was a lot of pomp and circumstance, but at least the people saw him and at least people heard him and knew him. Um, but what happens here is that, uh, you know, increasingly they don't see him. He becomes a remote and a distant figure. And then the normal mass is becoming more and more a mass celebrated uh, by just one priest instead of the bishop's mass. Okay, so these are some of the things that are going on. And one of the things that, that the Gauls were responsible for in our liturgy today that we just assume is traditional 
is the recitation of the creed. The creed originally had nothing to do with mass. It was baptismal profession of faith. And it became those baptismal professions of faith were also, also served as standards of faith. So councils would take a baptismal creed, like Nicaea took one, and enrich it to make much clearer that Jesus uh, was the incarnation of the word who was God, not a, a creature. And so, you know, that happened there. And then the stands on the Holy Spirit gets expanded at the next council because they, they need to make very clear that the Holy Spirit is divine. But anyway, the creed originally is baptismal profession was never recited at mass. But in the East, because of the controversy with the Arians and then the controversy with those who denied the Holy Spirit's divinity, it became customary as a counterbalance to that, to recite the creed in the divine liturgy. And that was never done in Rome. And who picked it up first? It was the Gauls. They had to fight remnants of Arianism in Spain and in other parts of Europe because the barbarian tribes, other than the Franks, were Arian. And so they used the, a creed at mass. And they actually had a little addition in the translation, Latin translation of the creed that they used because they want to emphasize the divinity of the Son against the Arians. So filioque, that the, Father, the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, was an addition of the Gauls or the Franks. So that was added in Gallican areas, you know, and it, it largely to emphasize the Son's divinity. But that creed, uh, the, the, the creed of Nicene, Nicaea Constantinople, translated into Latin with the filioque, was said customarily all throughout Gaul and the Frankish Empire. So when the emperor comes to Rome and goes to mass at the beginning of the 11th century, and he doesn't see the creed being said, he said, what's going on here? And the Pope said, well, we've never said the creed. It's not our tradition to say the creed at mass. And, and the emperor basically said, well, from now on it will be. <laughs> so anyway, that's how the creed got into the Roman mass was through the influence of the Franks and the insistence of the Frankish emperor. You know, keep in mind, the emperors had great amount to do with uh, a lot of ecclesiastical things in the East and in the West. It was the emperors who called the council. Yes, the Pope had to confirm all ecumenical councils in the, in the East, but it was the emperor who called them. And in the West, the, the emperor uh, initiated a lot of liturgical things. And of course, they had to be approved by the Pope to be celebrated in Rome, no doubt. But nonetheless, it was at the initiative and the insistence um, and the, the, the lobbying, if you will, of, of the Pope, I mean, excuse me, of the Emperor. Okay, there's one more thing that we need to discuss before we finish this video, and that is a sad development. Um, at least that's the way we see it. We see it now. I think that's the way that the church has seen it uh, in the last uh, uh, 200 years or so, really. And that is that the Eucharistic prayer, which had always been the center of the Eucharistic celebration, the Eucharistic prayer went into a certain kind of eclipse. And the reason for it seems to have begun, as we do our best to understand it historically, it seems to have begun in the East, and it seems to have begun because of the length of the service that while the, the, the chant of the Sanctus is going on, maybe a very elaborate or lengthy chant, um, the bishop starts saying the canons under his breath uh, in a quiet voice while the choir is singing. That seems to be how it started in the East. But soon in the East, the sense of awe and majesty starts to develop um, about the Eucharist and, and gets heightened. And so a mystical interpretation gets overlaid on this very practical thing that had happened. And that is that, the, that this is the Holy of Holies. This is the sacred action. It's too sacred for anyone to hear. So it's spoken in a low voice. Um, and that really doesn't fit at all with what, you know, uh, is said by St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 14, 16, about the importance of people being able to hear and understand in order to say their amen. You know, prior to this time, this makes its way over to Gaul and then it makes its way to Rome. And Rome resists it like it resists a lot of innovations. Uh, but, you know, it, it by, by the probably by around the year uh, 900 or so, it, this starts in Rome as well through Gallican influence. So the, the, the canon now is quiet. Um, it's, it's, it's in a low voice and it's not heard by anyone except the, the bishop or the priest celebrant. 
Okay. Um, I also want to point out that a new interpretation of the priest and bishop uh, or the celebrant arises at this time. It starts again in the East. And that is the priest, the, the, you know, there's always been an idea of the bishop as the high priest. But now, reading the Old Testament, the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies alone once a year. And so the idea of the sanctuary being the Holy of Holies into which the priest retreats becomes prominent. And you start getting all, veils around the altar that are closed during certain moments. And, you know, you combine that with the, the low voice of the, um, of the celebrant. And so you get this image um, that he alone goes into the Holy of Holies and everyone waits outside. Now, that wasn't in Israel. That wasn't the typical sacrifice. Again, it was only Yom Kippur. And it actually wasn't a sacrifice either. You know, the sacrifices took place outside in the temple courtyard with everyone present who wanted to be there. But anyway, this is what happens in, in people's minds. And so this idea becomes part of the West. It comes to Gaul first from the East, and then it makes its way finally to Rome, where um, the priest is seen this in this sort of way. And uh, this also, at the, about in the 6th century, we have the first evidence of an of a, a, a altar being not in the center of a chancel area, but being put against a wall in the apse, and the priest praying um, with his back to the people the whole time. And that is actually kind of just in local small parishes. It's not the normal way to celebrate the Eucharist for the Bishop's Mass. And it doesn't become so for until about the year 1000. So by the year 1000 or so, now it becomes customary. Canons in a low voice. Um, and, and the priest is seen as the, the high priest who's, who's away from everybody, you know, and all by himself. And, and the mass becomes much less of a dialogue between the people and the priests. So the people still say the great amen, but they can't hear what's going on. And they can't see what's going on either. We're going to see in later centuries, we're going to stop uh, right, right here at this point and see that, you know, the, the, the story of liturgical um, evolution is a story that has some wonderful additions, but there's also some losses. That's something that's not seen, I think, by some folks um, when they look at the history of the liturgy, but that's what we're seeing right here. This is a loss uh, that, that is a, a profound one, and we're going to see some other losses in the next several centuries, as well as some, some gains of some beautiful customs and traditions that, uh, that are dear to many of us. <music>